mein Name ist Andres Lepig, ich bin der Direktor des Architekturmuseums der TU München und freue mich, Sie so in so großer Zahl heute zu unserem ausstellungsöffnenden Vortrag begrüßen zu dürfen. Es ist wirklich schön, dass Sie diese erstmalige Chance nutzen, dass wir zu einer Ausstellung, zu einer Eröffnung vorher einen Vortrag vorschalten. Aber es wäre auch sonst sehr schwierig gewesen, Rahul Merotra, der heute den Vortrag halten wird, noch einmal so schnell nach München zu kriegen. Er fliegt zwar oft von Mumbai nach Boston über München, aber dann bleibt er manchmal nur eine Stunde am Flughafen oder zwei Stunden, wo wir dann ein Arbeitsgespräch führen können, aber da hätten wir sie nicht zu einem Vortrag hingebracht. Kurzum, heute eröffnen wir die Ausstellung Does Permanence Matter? Ephemeral Urbanism. Dazu werden wir nachher nach diesem Vortrag gleich noch ein paar Sätze sagen, wieso, warum, weshalb, wieso. Und jetzt äh, werden, werde ich erstmal Ihnen kurz Raoul Merotra auf Deutsch vorstellen, um dann ins Englische zu wechseln, weil sein Vortrag auch auf Englisch ist. Und will nur ganz kurz vorschalten, Raoul Merotra ist Architekt, ist Stadtplaner, ist Forscher und Hochschullehrer an der Graduate School of Design in Harvard University in Boston und in Cambridge, Boston. Und er ist auch, halt unterhält sein Büro, er ist der Gründer des Büros äh, RMA Raoul Merotra Architects in Mumbai. Also er ist konstant auf der Welt unterwegs und dabei hat er viele Dinge beobachtet, unter anderem eben äh, die, dieses Phänomen des Ephemeral Urbanism, den er gleich erklärt, das er gleich erklären wird. Er ist äh, Professor für Stadtplanung, das heißt, ihn interessiert eben diese, interessieren diese Phänomene, äh, was bede bedeutet Stadt, wie verändert sich Stadt und wie kann Stadt auch aktiv verändert werden in, für die globalen Fragen, die uns alle angehen und ich denke, ich denke, hier wird die Ausstellung, zu der wir nachher noch mehr sagen werden, dann auch einige Antworten bieten. So, having said this, um, short introduction in German, and I mean, Rahul, you know your CV, so uh, I didn't uh, reveal any other secrets of your life. Uh, it was just to introduce you, and now the podium is yours. Thank you, take it away. Thank you, Andres. Uh, I trust you completely in what you said, so. Thank you very much, and uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here uh, in Munich. Uh, lovely city uh, with always very interesting things happening, so many thanks for not only hosting the exhibition in the museum, but also uh, for the invitation to do this lecture. So this lecture, in a sense, is a preface to the exhibition, which I hope you all will enjoy afterwards. Uh, and it's a collaborative uh, project with my colleague, Felipe Vera, who's sitting here, who's also with Andreas Lepic and Marcelo, uh, one of the co-curators of the exhibition. So what I'm going to do um, uh, this evening is break this presentation into two parts. In the first part, I'm going to try to frame what I think are the issues that make uh, it important for us to look at the question of ephemeral urbanism within the context and the theory and the debates about urbanism more generally, uh, because I think the moment is right for that, and I think that's what also compelled uh, Andreas to do uh, this exhibition. And in the second half of the presentation, I will focus and show you one case, uh, which is the Kum Mela, uh, which is, we call the world's biggest ephemeral megacity, uh, so just a case uh, uh, to talk about this. So to to start with ephemeral urbanism, I think for me in our discussions about urbanism today, the word flux becomes very important. And so this research is focused on the idea that cities are in constant flux. And as human beings, we deal with the idea of flux by trying to aspire towards permanence. And so permanence becomes a default condition when we imagine cities or the built environment. And that as the flux increases, in our lives, I think permanence becomes a bigger aspiration. And so in that context, I think it is worth interrogating and uh, uh, discussing this question. Even the question of what is urban is becoming problematic. And this is just a map of India showing the night lights. And you see the continuum of urbanization. Uh, and I have a colleague in Harvard called Neil Brenner who arg argues that 
Urbanism now is a planetary phenomena. He, he argues that there's nothing of the rural left uh, because a farmer in Guatemala listening to FM uh, using an iPhone is as urban as someone living in Munich, for example. So this blur between what is the urban and the rural and that continuum also complicates the question. So flux becomes a very important category for us, I think, to be discussing. And from that, my early research, I began to uh, react to the way we organize our thinking about cities, which is we tend to construct binaries to understand the world around us. And binaries are very important uh, in understanding and organizing the world in our head. But for us as designers, binaries are actually a non-productive instrument because when you make binaries, the formal city, the informal the city, the rich, the poor, the state, and private enterprise, these are binaries. Then we tend to live in one of those worlds. So we become architects of the informal city, or we become architects of the formal city with the developer and with the government, etc. So when we construct binaries, we don't create synthesis. And I think in the world today, the most important need, I believe, whether it's the politics that we engage with, is synthesis, to come back to the middle path in some ways. So the category that I use to describe urbanism is the kinetic city, because these are cities that are always in flux. And the city I live in, Mumbai, exaggerates this question, and therefore I just want to share with you how my thinking about this or our thinking with Philippe through many seminars we did and research that this came about. So the informal economy is usually a category in which we easily look at this. And you see, in a country like India, 90% of the economy is informal economy. It's mind-boggling. Even in Peru, it's about 54. In most of Latin America, it's over 50%. And so when we look at the images of the informal economy, it means they're hawkers, they're people who live on the streets. I call this the five stages of squatting. And my cities in India are made like this. So this guy's in the third stage of squatting. So in one year from a little stall, it becomes permanent and it becomes part of the paraphernalia. It's incremental. And then by extension, the whole city looks like that. We call this slums. I call it auto-constructed environments because these are self-made through an other logic. But that becomes more than 50% of the city. It's not the city that we imagine. It's not the city where it is not the city beautiful for sure because it's a coexistence of two worlds. Uh, and often, this is an aesthetic of informality. The people who live in these what we might call shanties or auto-constructed environments, are often employed in the formal economy. They're employed in government offices. They're employed in corporations. But it's the aesthetic that we begin to construct these binaries. And this extends into the logic of the city. This is a map at scale of Manhattan and Mumbai. In Manhattan, you see large public space. You see Central Park, uh, which we'll come back in another slide. And in Mumbai, you see the green space is fractured. It's fragmented. The open space in Mumbai for the population is probably the lowest in the world. Even Tokyo has more open space than Mumbai. That diagram is to scale. You can look at Delhi and how much open space it has. And that diagram, Mumbai, in that calculation, that includes the traffic islands, the green in the traffic islands. So it's a desperate calculation uh, of, of, of density. As a result of that, our open spaces get used for many things. These are the big maidans, which are used for cricket, which is a very popular sport. As I say, it's this wonderful Indian game that the English invented, uh, and uh, <laughs> it's played by everybody there. But these same spaces in the evening, they become places for weddings. Uh, and you see the wedding has wrapped around the cricket pitch. The cricket pitch is sacred, so nobody touches it. And this is the club of the cricket goers, and they have tea from the same kitchen, nice samosas, uh, and there's a synergy here. And by the morning, this disappears and the cricketers come back. It only is there for a few hours. So it's a very mobile architecture, and architects are not involved in this. This is a city that is constructed by common people through common intelligence. Architecture is not even the spectacle of the city. These large festivals like the Ganesh Chaturthi, Durga Puja, Moharram, there are Metazia, there are many, many, many festivals. Um, uh, you know, your Oktoberfest could maybe qualify as a festival. The carnival is a festival. But this is our greatest festival, the Ganesh festival. And here, on the last day after 10 days of celebration, uh, the god is immersed in the water. And so here, immersion becomes 
a metaphor for the spectacle of the city because when the clay idol dissolves in the water of the bay, the spectacle comes to a close. There are no mechanisms to encode this spectacle. Here, the memory of the city is an enacted process. It's, it's a process of motion, which is not, it's a temporal moment, it's temporary. And it's a, that is very different from buildings, which we all as societies, when we want the permanent city, buildings are used to encode the memory. Here, the spectacle is an enacted process, it's action. So the city and its architecture don't even have the same meaning. Uh, and within what I'm calling as the kinetic city, meanings are not stable. Spaces get consumed, they get reinterpreted, they get recycled. And the kinetic city actually recycles the static city to create new spectacles. But there's a synergy, they both have to coexist. So this city is about elasticity. It's about incrementalism. It's about the appropriation of space. And it's about soft thresholds, where different parts of society transgress into each other's spaces. Things coexist. And so architecture is a deadly instrument that creates hard thresholds. Actually, architecture and zoning as an instrument of planning separates people. It doesn't bring people together. But I think the intelligence of the kinetic city, a city in flux, allows transgressions. My colleague Christian Werthmann uh, has this wonderful uh, diagram which says that the way we have as a society from the 60s dealt with this condition of flux is denial. Then we have dealt with it through eradication when new governments are formed, whether it's dictatorships or even sometimes in democracy. Then from the 80s and 90s we began to tolerate these environments, tolerate the poor, try to integrate them in the city. In the 90s we began improvement projects to upgrade slums, to integrate the city and the city of the poor with the formal city, the informal and the formal and create. But really, as a society and as architects, we should be anticipating. So we cannot not discuss flux because the only way we can anticipate flux movement of large amount of people, which is going to happen on the planet, is through anticipation. My colleague, Joan Busquets, has a wonderful diagram where he says, in the traditional city, you had urbanization, then you had division of plots, and then you had building. In the garden city development, you had urban urbanization and plot division together, a developer did that, and then they made plots and people would build houses. In housing estates, like gated communities, which developers do, it becomes one. It's urbanization, plot division, and building, which happen together. In today's world, actually, building is happening first, then you have plot division, and then you have urbanization. So the whole process of urbanization for more than 50% of the world is completely reversed. Uh, and added to that, it's become a global phenomena. This is a diagram of migration. I mean, you're dealing with the refugee question here, but if you look at between India and the Middle East, uh, the migration is massive amounts of people. It goes into millions. Or if you look at the top, the diagram between Mexico and the United States, which the right-wing government there is dealing with right now, uh, is massive. It's nothing compared to the issues that Europe is dealing with uh, today in terms of numbers. I mean, I think culturally, uh, you know, for many other reasons, there are different sorts of questions. Historically, this process of migration or the flux was much more controlled and predictable. We could anticipate it because the connections were between the colonies. That was the conduit of the movement of people. That is quite different from this, which is like much more through the process of globalization, randomized, uh, depending on what happens where. Uh, and of course, the numbers are beginning to creep into Europe. This is the diagram of that new movement, and the numbers are becoming quite large. Who would have imagined that we would see diagrams or images like this dealing with Europe even four years ago? This has become kind of the reality. Uh, and you know the numbers are staggering uh, when, at least outside Germany and outside Europe, when we look at the news reports and we wonder how and how can we deal with this? This hasn't been anticipated. Flux is not even a question that we discuss in urbanism? Uh, is this temporary? Is it, a, is it a flood that can be held back? I mean, there's a limit to how it can be dealt with in the way we deal with it. Are these the new images of the city uh, in terms of how we will deal with it? I, I don't know what the answer is. I think what I'm putting forward as a proposition is this has to be a question within the, de the debates about urbanization for us to even imagine what happens. I think the biggest challenge for the design profession is how do you imagine 
imagine transitions. Uh, we, we, in, the, in the planning disciplines uh, all over the world, we, we don't pay any attention to the design of transitions because we think in terms of absolute solutions. We think of the end state planning. That has become the default condition. It's another way of saying that permanence is the default condition because we are confident as a society that we can find absolute solutions. The design of transitions is complicated. People who deal, nations that deal with energy, for example, are always discussing how do you go from uh, fossil fuels to renewables. In a country like India, we can't jump from fossil fuels to renewables because our economy will collapse. So we decided, unfortunately, to go through the nuclear path, which is a completely different direction, and then we'll come to renewables. Now, we might get stuck with nuclear and not be able to reach renewables, but at least the imagination is to design that transition. So in the same way, what are the equivalents for urban planning? That means sometimes you might have to take the city in a direction which seems weird and crazy, but it might be the only way to come to an end result, rather than thinking in terms of absolute and thinking we can make the jump. And that becomes a problem because we think of only the static city, uh, the city which is defined by buildings. The city beautiful is the ultimate. Vienna, places like that, are the ultimate uh, example of the city beautiful, which when we study urban planning theory, we look at as the models. This is what I call the landscape of capitals, of impatient capital. Capital by nature is impatient. It has to realize itself very quickly. And so these are very brittle forms. I'm so, they don't worry, there's no place like this. It's just a Photoshop image. Uh, but we could have places like this. Uh, this is where architecture is the central spectacle of the city. And this is driven by capital and places that make capital frictionless. Shanghai, Dubai, these have become the new models that architects sort of look at and architecture is created in. But they're brittle because these are autocracies. They're not even democracies. So democracy Democracies around the world are looking at Shanghai, looking at Dubai. In India, they're using, the government uses this as a model. It's completely crazy because you forget that we are a democracy and we want to be a democracy. We don't want to be an autocracy. And so architecture is very telling of the politics and the political aspiration because we have to think of transitions and not absolutes. And so in this context, I believe, and we believe, Felipe, myself, Andreas, a lot of us who've been talking about this, that is very important. We also find a way of bringing the question of the ephemeral. And so it was really in this context that we began to look at this research work on ephemeral urbanism to say, how can we look at this differently? We looked historically at your wonderful Christmas markets, even in Europe. Uh, these are just wonderful ways. They come, they appear, they disappear. They're about human contact. Uh, the, the thing about these places is also they bring a different humanity to our city, the markets in Mexico, on parking lots, 50,000 vendors every weekend. I mean, this is amazing if you look at what flux means. Look at these markets in Southeast Asia. In America, these are trailer parks. Extraction towns, these are towns. What we are looking at are places which all have an expiration date. So these are towns which are made for mines, and they know that in 50 years, the resource will be over, so the town has to move. So they are also temporary. It's just that the time frame is different. It's not one weekend, but it's 50 years. So I think how does one bring time into the imagination of urban planning? For celebration, Burning Man, it's phenomenal that 60,000 Americans largely organize themselves and they leave no trace. There's not a trace left at the end of it. This whole thing disappears in the 50 days or whatever time period, or Hajj in the way uh, Millions of people organize around infrastructure, but in a temporary way. These are cities. These are cities bigger than most cities in Europe, 10 times the size of most cities in Europe. So they're not small sort of uh, places. Or military camps uh, here in Afghanistan. This is a German camp in Afghanistan. Some of these are now lasting for 20 years. They're American camps that have been around for 20 years. So they're not, they are temporary, but there's a time there's a different time imagination, or Haiti, this is after the tsunami when we reconstruct things, or refugee camps, which have become cities in themselves. Uh, I mean, these are 
Dabad has like uh, 400,000 people who live there, and they've been living there for 25 years. There's a whole generation that's grown up in those places, uh, and now they don't know how to what to do with it. And you know, these are big, big issues which are not in the mainstream of the discussion about urbanism, of city planning, etc. I mean, these are towns bigger than, like I said, most European towns. So what we did was we created a taxonomy to understand this which is looking at transactions, religion, strife, disasters, extraction, which is mining towns, celebration, refuge, which is refugee camps, and military. And so this is a taxonomy that we created as part of the research. And I think what's very interesting you'll see in the exhibition is the designers of the exhibition, together with the curator, they took this, but they've organized the exhibition according to scale, from the smallest to the biggest. Uh, so you understand how, with scalar differences, the architecture and and the imagination of the place changes. And I think that's a really interesting shift uh, that uh, has been made here. So then how do you imagine time and how do you map time? I don't know the answer, but we are struggling with trying to find a productive way to bring the question of time into the discussion uh, about these cities and how might that influence the city. And this is not an argument to say we should have only temporary cities or we should have only permanent cities or we should not have permanent cities. This is an argument to say that our permanent cities, our imagination of permanence needs to also accommodate more of the temporary flux and we'll find better, more robust, more sustainable solutions in that way rather than lock ourselves into an absolute solution very quickly because we are reacting to a crisis today which might not be a crisis in four years or five years. And so time as an imagination becomes very important. These are videos that are in the uh, exhibition but I'm just going to show you a minute or two so you kind of understand uh, the, the kinds of images of places like this. So these are all the cases around the world. We looked at about 300, which are all 20,000 people, 50,000 people in these temporary settlements. Many of these cases you'll see in the exhibition presented differently. So this was just to give you a sense, and these films are all there, and this culminated in this uh, research on the ephemeral. And now I'll share with you one case that um, I think for us was the starting point, and it's a fascinating case, which is the Kum Mela. And it's an extreme example of a religious congregation that generates a mega city as a temporary settlement, and it's for a Hindu religion uh, ce celebration which happens every 12 years. Uh, and so that's what sort of it looks like uh, when it's established. And uh, it accommodates about five to seven million people who live there for 55 days, and then it has a flux on five particular bathing days that are sacred 
20 million more people visit. So totally about 120 million people visit. The Harvard Business School, working with cell phone companies in, uh, in, in India, have done a scientific research, and the findings just came out three or four months ago, where they can now establish through cell phone numbers that registered there that a minimum of 72 million people visited the Kumbh Mela, which means that the 100 million is easily accurate because everyone won't have had a cell phone. So it's a mind-boggling uh, feat and a great success, I believe. It's one of the most successful things the Indian government does um, in terms of uh, organization. It's just totally uh, mind-boggling. Not that they don't do many other interesting and successful things, but this one is, for me, one that uh, is really very interesting. So the, the thing about it is that it, it has, there's a particular imagination about it, which is what the press plays out, and I'm just going to show you a clip of news at that time. It's celebrated as just millions of people, millions of people. It will last over 55 days and crores of people will attend. Here are the many facets of what makes the festival a vibrant and colorful one. These Akharas, once the training camps of warriors, are the nucleus of the Kumbh. They are now monasteries that host wandering sadhus and sadhvis. Near a million people this is the Japanese press now. This river on Monday, with many more expected to arrive as the world's largest religious gathering kicked off. Tens of millions of Hindu pilgrims are making their way to Allahabad in the northern Indian state of Uttar Pradesh. They are arriving for the Mahakumbh Mila, or Grand Pitcher Festival, to base where the Ganges and Yumna rivers meet the mythical Sarasvati River. Millions of pilgrims arrived in Allahabad as the Kumbh Mela kicked off. Uh, thousands were taking a holy dip in the Ganga. And the, this is, of course, one of the most important parts of the event, which takes place once every 12 years. Uh, the Kumbh Mela is seen as possibly the biggest gathering which takes place anywhere in the world. So you see the news is emphasizing big, millions, millions, millions. And so we thought that my God, if there were millions and millions of people coming, there must be some logic, there must be a system. And that's what actually triggered off the research. And again, I'll just share with you two minutes of uh, the, the, the film that you'll again see here, which sort of gives you some images from our perspective to try to make sense of it. And then I'll show you how the city is organized. These are hospitals that they have. the food camps.
So it's crazy, I mean, trying to make sense of something as intense as this was, was, was really a challenge for us. So to go to the beginning, it, this is a Hindu festival. So one of the things, it is, has a single purpose. Uh, and as the legend goes, uh, this is the goddess Mohini. And Kum means pot. And Kum Mela means the festival of the pot. And the reason for that is what you see her carrying is the nectar of life that uh, the gods had given her. And uh, the gods had blessed her to take that to create the universe. But then the demons chased her and they wanted to get the, the sacred nectar. And there was a battle between the demons and the gods, and the battle lasted uh, for 12 celestial days, which is 12 human years, and that's why this happens every 12 years, based on planetary alignments. But in the process of that battle, four drops of the holy nectar fell, and one of the places it fell was Alaba. It also fell in Ujjain, Hardwar, and Nasik, where also they have much smaller versions of the Kum. So Alaba, which is the confluence of the Ganges uh, and the Yamuna, the two sacred rivers, every 12 years becomes the spot where if you have a bath in the Sangam, which is in the confluence on four or five particular days, the Hindus believe you are freed from rebirth, which is a very compelling idea. So that draws a lot of people. I mean, it's like, and people go even two or three times because they want to make sure they don't get reborn. So th over 36 years, I know people who've gone three times. Uh, and so that is, so it's a very powerful, well, let me say virtual, compelling, abstract, or if you're a believer, a very firm idea, which allows people to come together. And it's the biggest Hindu congregation. So even Buddhism, for example, is seen as a reform movement of Hinduism. So the Dalai Lama goes there and he has congregations. So all it's, it's, it was originally also a congress of the leaders, that is the priests who would come and meet with their disciples. But of course now it's become much more than that. It was only the British who began to, I think some British officer must have arrived there in the 1890s and seen like a few million people and got, thought there was going to be a revolution, so they decided they'll start organizing it. And the earliest maps that I found of the Kumela in our research, all of us, was 1954, uh, where they actually started making a grid uh, and organizing it. That's the Indians after our independence. The British had their own way, the records weren't there, but the earlier records from the British time show that they were really concerned about disease and public health because when you have so many million people, I mean, this is a place for epidemic. I know people who, who when they were children, remember getting a smallpox inoculation at the station. They were not allowed to go to the Kummela unless they had their inoculations. So it became, for the public health people, it's a great example where this became the world's health camp in a sense because they had so many rural people captive that they would actually do projects like that. And then the British found that that the different akharas or the religious groups used to have battles to have a bath first because those five days, you know, there was a big demand and very little supply of space. So the British started organizing a timetable at what time, who would have a bath, and you know, they, so they made, they bought order, they had a lottery system. So it's very interesting how over time it's got actually organized as a city. Uh, and then of course these are later maps that you see, uh, they're different reiterations. Because what happens is you can't have a static map because because after the monsoon, the way the river moves, the land that opens up for the city on the banks of the river is completely different every 12 years. So you can't have one plan, but you have to plan it. So what we've done is created a massive database, uh, which is now geospatially referenced. So for researchers for the next 12 years, whoever is some university in Germany is interested, we would be happy to collaborate and show you all this. Uh, so we've done a full documentation of this. We also mounted uh, cameras on cars and did Google Street Views, so we've also got a documentation. We had to get permission to do that. The most interesting thing was that because of the security, the government didn't give us permission for drones or aerial photography, and we thought you had to do that. And we found in the laws, there was no law that stopped you from taking photographs from a kite. So we put a camera on a kite, and this is Dinesh Mehta, local photographer from Ahmedabad, uh, and we actually, all the images that you will see are uh, images we took from the kite. You can see the camera hanging from the kite, and remotely it could go 360 degrees, so we did a full mapping uh, using uh, the kite. We organized it through religion, because this was a big thing. We looked at urbanism, because that was important. We looked at business, because also it's a market where 
if there are seven million people living there, people have to buy and sell. We looked at technology. It was the first Kum Mela, 2012, where the cell phone appeared because 12 years before that, nobody had a cell phone uh, in India, so it was a big opportunity. We looked at health because public health was very important, and we looked at government because it was a public-private partnership. The priests have to work with the police, as you can see this conversation in the image. We looked at engineering, which was also very important. And this was also, I think, a very important dimension of this project in the context of this institution, the university, is that it was an interdisciplinary project because we realized that no one discipline could understand this because it wasn't a city as we imagine cities. Uh, it was about all of this. So we had people from the business school, school of public health, school of design, school of religion, and the faculty of arts and sciences, and 40 people with Felipe Vera and myself we went there and five, six faculty and actually lived there uh, to do this mapping. The public health people lived right throughout because they got data on public health, on disease, which is also an interesting, very fascinating area which you know, I, I don't have the time to talk about. But this is an aerial image during the monsoon. So this is the two rivers. That confluence is uh, where the most holy spot is. And they have to build a city of 7 million people around this. And they have from the end of October, because the water dries up. Monsoon finishes in September. Water dries up by end of September. So they have October, half of October, November, and December to have the city for 7 million people ready, because the festival starts in January. So that is the jurisdiction of the city. This is what the site looks like before the river recedes. And when the river recedes, you get the sand, and it's different every time, and that becomes the site. So it's a very light city. It sits on the sand. It has no foundations, uh, and it can be reversed very easily. So it leaves no memory except for what you see in the lines of the grid. And in eight weeks, you have a whole city that sort of appears. And that's the satellite image of the city after it was built. So you see the sand banks, you see the bridges, and it gets occupied. And it, it has suburbs. My image doesn't, it has suburbs right at the end. Uh, so it, it, it is 7 million people. That is just to give you a comparison with Manhattan, and that is Central Park on the top. Uh, so it has that kind of um, expanse in terms of area. We went there in October before the river receded, and that was the image. And from the same spot, you can see the same tree, we went back in eight weeks, and the whole city had completely appeared a city for 7 million people. It's kind of mind-boggling that that can happen. These are all before and after images. You see uh, it, it sort of appearing. It's on a perfect grid. That is the big open area where the bathing happens, and so that's why there's so much open space there. But, but that's sort of the nature of the city. It's on a perfect grid because that's the only way you can kind of really can organize it. And this is the density within each quarter of that grid. Uh, it's rather dense. It also is a city that relates to the hinterland because it uses the resources from the hinterland through a network of roads, railway, uh, that material comes in. And what's very interesting is the material goes out. Everything that is the city is built from gets recycled in the hinterland. The bridges, the material, it goes, the government sends it to some of the villages, they have electricity, the wiring goes in, so it all gets recycled. So the material geography is fascinating. And I think these are the kinds of lessons we felt that could be applied to other crisis situations to understand how this flux can operate, both in terms of the movement of people, but also the material material geography uh, and its ability to be reabsorbed somewhere. So this is a road in the island, which is a memory from 12 years before, because this island did not get covered in the water, so the road network sort of stayed. But it's a shifting context, so the grid is very it's very robust because you can put a grid on it and whatever way the river goes, the grid works. But what is amazing about this grid, as opposed to a grid in any city where one or two bridges cross the river, here every road crosses the river. There's a bridge across every road. So the grid does not recognize the river in a sense. It connects itself completely and the river can be in between. So that means even if there's an unseasonal rain, like happened that time, and the river moves or overflows, it doesn't disturb uh, the grid at all. So it's a shifting grid and a very robust grid. And you can see every road goes across uh, in a pontoon bridge, sometimes bigger, uh, sometimes smaller. So there are these 17 or I think 27 uh, pontoon bridges, which is an army operation. It's all done in eight weeks. Um, it's fabricated, floated, and connected. Uh, and we also 
digitized it, so we've got an AutoCAD drawing where we actually digitized every tent. Um, we, Felipe and I felt very, very sympathetic for the students who did that and for their eyesight, uh, but, but they actually managed it, which means now with this drawing, we can measure density, we can predict in the next time how people could be organized in space. I mean, I can talk at length about this, but I want to share with you two or three things that might be useful in the time that we have. Uh, one is that we discovered that the whole city is made out of five materials, the entire city, uh, which is cloth or fabric, uh, bamboo, which is eight feet tall in modules of eight feet, nails or screws, string or rope, uh, and those are the five, and corrugated metal sometimes to create a skin. And the entire city, the temples, the community halls, the government offices, the hospitals, the tents for people to live in, it's only these five materials that appear above ground, uh, which is totally mind boggling. So you have different kinds of tents, and all the way in that scale, those are large temples from the smallest tent. You can see the eight foot bamboo, that is the module. And that's how it can be assembled so quickly, it can be deployed so quickly, and it can be reassembled or deconstructed uh, so quickly uh, and recycled. And so some of these structures are massive. Here's one temple coming up. It gets clad in cloth. Uh, it, it has song. It's about celebration. So this is different, of course, from a refugee camp, which is about disaster. You've been dislocated. This is about people coming together. That also contributes uh, to its success. And there's a whole typology of these temples. They're completely different. They're scales here, 107 havans or prayers can can happen simultaneously, so this is like hyper-religious in a sense, uh, in, in terms of, and these are some of the statistics, uh, you know, uh, 30 million people at a peak capacity, buses, their special trains, it simulates a real city, it's a mega city with all its dimensions of social as well as physical infrastructure. There are 10,500 sweepers, and I, I sincerely, I've seen many Indian cities, this was the cleanest Indian city I visited for 10 days uh, when it was in operation, it was immaculate, I mean you never saw one piece of waste uh, anywhere, there are hospitals, ambulances, police, you know, uh, yeah, this is one of the sweepers. I mean, they're continuously cleaning it. This is a hospital, and there are many hospitals. Uh, and then different elements combine, and this is the sandbags, which are made from sand to make the edge of the river so that from flooding they're protected for safety. Uh, this is an infrastructure of toilets. They have toilets in every quarter. There are enough, there are more toilets per person. In Mumbai, there's one toilet for 1,440 people. Here, there's one toilet for about 10 people. So it's remarkable that you have a proportion that they managed to achieve like this in a temporary way. So we actually studied the different typology of toilets, how they were used, uh, you know, what was um, the, the use patterns. Hopefully that this will be helpful in the future. These are the roads, which are merely plates, which are put with two hooks, uh, and you have these roads because it's the sand, and it's compressed sand. So this is a road, this is a guy delivering milk. Milk is big. Uh, so they allow for older people sometimes uh, vehicles like this, but otherwise it's a completely pedestrian city and cycles. Uh, we also documented the making of the bridges, which there were no drawings of. So now we have fabrication drawings for the bridges, which will be useful for, for the government. I mean, you know, I jokingly tell my, my friends that you know, so far, for 5,000 years, this city has been happening in an oral tradition. So the IS officer who is appointed as a commissioner, he calls up his friends from the past 12 years, they appoint people, and they make this city happen. And so now, my biggest fear is in 10 years, they, they follow the Harvard manual for the Kumbh Mela, and it'll be a complete disaster. <laughs> it's one case study that might not work. Uh, anyway, so these are the roads and all the different forms of, inf these are the bus stations. This was before people started coming, so these are terminals so people can take buses to villages, police, uh, fire stations. This is a very amazing NGO that has been working for 40 years. If I, if I say it in Hindi for people here who might understand, is bhule bhatke mahilayon tatha bachon ka shivir. So, all my friends refer it to as the lost and found bureau. But it's worse than that. It's actually lost and abandoned. There's no optimism of finding here. <laughs> because a lot of children get lost. And a lot of, and this is a sad dimension, a lot of old widows get abandoned by their family, especially if they're living in poverty. Because Banaras is very close, and Banaras is considered as a good place to die. Uh, and so this NGO actually connects people. Uh, and it, 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 it makes these families, it, 
checks out whether people are genuinely abandoned and connects them again, but it also helps the children find their, and you know, it does such an amazing service and it's underplayed. Uh, but it's a, uh, it's a fantastic NGO and these three people run the NGO and they make announcements and there's a big balloon that above their shed so you can identify it. Very simple technologies, but incredibly effective. This is police control. Security is, you don't feel it at all. They have, they have 10,000 police officers and and each police officer has, he's in charge or she's in charge of 10,000 square feet. And for 55 days, they get to know everybody in that 10,000 square feet. So it's the most personalized security operation I've seen. And they have cell phones, they have a command center, they can take a picture if they find somebody new has come. I mean, we were the only odd people there taking photographs of generators and substations. And so we were often stopped and they would just make a call and they would be told by the headquarters that these guys are legitimate and we would work. But very very, very efficient. So there were no really any security incidents. There was a scare that this for terrorism, for other, this would have been a prime space. Uh, but it's so, so efficiently done in very simple, easy ways. Now, we can argue, you know, this is, I often say, this is like a big Indian wedding where all the relatives, they put all their fights and their differences and all come together to make it a success. So for 55 days, everyone does that. Uh, maybe in the longer term, sometimes those differences can't be uh, put aside. But this is what it looks like. They use, of course, technology and cameras, but it's really a religious festival. That's the heart of it, and that's what makes it very successful. It is a congregation of Hinduism where different and sex come together, they establish their own quarters, they're marked by these gateways. And this last thing I'll share with you, uh, this is the administration. You know, when we look at temporary settlements, we look at the temporal, we look at the ephemeral, uh, we, we, of course, it's an aesthetic question, things that are made out of cheap materials, etc. But what for us was really fascinating was in this case, the governance, the organization also works on a temporal scale, it changes. In our cities, and I think many cities around the world can't deal with the crises that we are facing because our governance systems are very static, even more static than the architecture of the city. And the command systems for those crises need to be more nimble, more flexible on a temporal scale. And here, this shifts. So for the first few months, the chief minister, the big bosses, for one year, they are planning the master plan, the budget. Then a different group of people get involved. The bureaucrats come in. Then the bureaucrats take over and different people are in charge because the tasks are different. During the, during the implementation the Kum Adhikari, which is the commissioner for the Mela, he has all the powers. The gentlemen you sit, see there, commissioner of Allahabad, the commissioner of the festival, they begin to interact on the ground. And they have a very little reporting they have to do to the center. They have the powers. They are empowered to do that. And during the construction, they can go outside the circle to get contractors, depending on the need, the crisis, etc. So the governance, governance system is robust and flexible and also moving on a temporal scale. So we have have to be careful that when we talk about the ephemeral, the temporal, it's not an aesthetic question, which is what you shouldn't mistake it, because there's a very deep organizational intelligence and logic which also needs to be mapped and understood in all the cases that you see in the exhibition, all the way from military camps uh, to other things. And so this is the map of the entire group of people who were involved. And then at the end, it's dismantled. This is in one week, it disappears. But before that, I'm gonna run you very quickly through slides which just show you the process. So the river is dry, they make it flat, they put the roads, the wires, they start marking it out, the different groups. Uh, they do a prayer to make it sacred. They do the divisions and the subdivisions. They start erecting it. They start making the temp, the cloth comes, the different layers, the fabric, uh, the decoration, the lights, the electricity, the toilets, uh, the pipes, the water supply, and the city appears. Uh, and, and then, it, the final festivals, they do a blessing to the river, they offer, this is the high priests of the whole celebration, and then it disappears. And in one week, it completely disappears. And this is when it's been removed. Uh, and the only remnants are these thatch mats on which people were sleeping on the tents, which when the flood comes, they all dissolve uh, in the water. And what is interesting is that it's a grid. 
and it's over in March. Until June, the farmers in the area, they have three months to grow crops. And because the grid is perfect, the farmers from the hinterland come in and they set up their farms here for three months because it's no man's land. It's the sand of the river. It's very fertile. And so they grow crops. They do agriculture and they grow a cycle of crops. And then the monsoon comes and it wipes out everything. There is no memory of the city. And that's what's left of what this was an image is just a virtual thing. So as an extreme case of ephemeral urbanism, I think the Kumbh Mela for us demystified and presented a kind of distilled narrative surrounding the deployment of a city in time. Issues that are absolutely negotiated here are, are, are as diverse as memory, geography, infrastructure, sanitation, public health, governance, ecology. And I think these parameters unfold their projective potential offering alternatives not only for rethinking cases within the boundaries of an ephemeral urbanism, but also of how embedded, softer, but perhaps more robust systems could be used in permanent cities. And the case exposes a very sharp condition in how the light, the indeterminate, the unspecific instruments also empower agents and could be useful tools in the gen generation of robustness and allowing for a highly complex process to flow easily. Uh, the Italian theorist Andrea Branzi advises us how to think of cities of the future. He suggests that we need to learn to implement reversibility Avoiding rigid solutions and definitive decisions as a model of sustainability. He also suggested approaches which allow spaces to be adjusted and reprogrammed with new activities not foreseen and not necessarily planned because we don't know how the future is going to imagine. And I think this is a huge sort of challenge for us. You know, we always, we ended the book like this and I kind of, I would like to end this with, you know, when Felipe and I went to thank a high head priest, a woman priest, who had helped us with all the arrangements, uh, you know, we told her we were going and things like that. And, uh, and while we were looking at all the physical stuff scientifically, you know, we, when we went to thank her, all she said was, she said, you know, you should feel blessed that the mother Ganges let you sit in her lap for a few days. So that is the kind of imagination of reversibility at a very profound level. And I think the challenge for us as a community, as societies, for you here in Europe, for us in Asia, is going to be how we synthesize and reconcile this. Uh, uh, an image of permanence, uh, but also us all knowing at the back of our minds that our cities are in flux and we have to find a way of dealing with impermanence. Thank you very much.